Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey, and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights, and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. Here at day two of the Moor Park Open Day, we caught up with Jack Nolan from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, who defends the proposed measures in the latest nitrates derogation and challenges farmers and industry to be more proactive about best practice for the future. The regulation was introduced in 2005, the first nitrate regulation in Ireland. The directive had been in place since 1991. As part of the process applying the regulation and bringing it into being, Ireland applied for derogation. And this is provided for in the directive if you can prove that it's not going to have a negative impact on water quality. So Ireland said, look, we have a long growing season. We have a moderate or a temperate climate with high levels of rainfall and high denitrification capacity in our soil. So in 2007, our first nitrates derogation was approved and that allowed farmers to apply livestock manure up as far as 250 kilos per hectare. And every time you review your regulations and you have to review them every four years in accordance with the directive, you have to reapply for the nitrates derogation. And we've done that each time. And you mentioned that, you know, every four years you're doing a reapplication. Um, there's, you know, there's some alterations to the rules as they have existed in the previous four years. Um, to you, um, working directly with it on a day to day basis, is there ever a concern that the exemptions that allow us to farm in the manner that we do for farms in derogation, is this something that may become a reality? Well, let's say it's something we should be taking very seriously in considering the model of production that we have. 65% of the dairy cows in Ireland are now on what we term intensive, so they're stocked greater than the standard limit of 170 kilos per hectare. 7,000 apply for derogation, another 4,500 export slurry to become compliant with the limit. And they're basing this application and our renewal on water quality and the impact of agriculture on water quality. Now, people may say, what about sewage, sludge and domestic waste and so on? And they're right, you know, there are problems there too. But a recent EPA report said that 85% of the nitrogen in some rural catchments in the water is coming from agriculture. And by 2030, we have to reduce the nutrients in the water by 50%. You know, so it's a real challenge. And I suppose what we're looking for is farmers to say, well, there are things we can do here. Research has shown it from Johnstown Castle, from Moor Park, that, you know, we can make improvements and we can, we can save nitrogen and we can reduce the losses. There will always be losses from farms, like they're not laboratories, and we have to accept that. But at the same time, we have to say we have to do the best of our ability to reduce losses from farms. So yeah, there is a risk. And and of those derogation farmers, so you mentioned there are 7,000 um, derogation farmers and another 4,500 yeah. exporting slurry. How many of those are dairy farmers? Uh, the majority are dairy farmers. You know, the majority of the derogation, I'm uncertain on the 4,500, but I presume it's the same. Like a third of the livestock now in Ireland is on those 11,000 or 11,500 farms. You know, so... It's quite a small area land, quite a small number of farmers that have become very intensive. Now, they may say that's in response to the marketplace. You know that you're not getting value or sorry, you're not getting paid properly for your product and you have to keep more. But it does mean that those areas where where land is being farmed intensively are leaking more to the environment. Because according to the EPA, if we apply 100 kilos of nitrogen, 30 of it will end up in the water. Chagas say that nitrogen use efficiency on farms is in the low 20s, 23 or 24 percent, whereas it could be up over 35 percent. You know, so there's an awful lot we could do. And dairy farmers use 50 percent of the nitrogen used in Ireland. So everything a dairy farmer does has a massive impact on the environment and on our water quality. I see you mention, you know, the the, the question that does arise and and it is, I guess, a, a debate that is included in the conversation around, you know, the effect of, of um, agriculture and water quality. You know, you, you acknowledge, you know, you, you mentioned sewage sludge and also domestic effects on water quality. And, and it's interesting. And, and obviously that is something that is taken into account within the, the Department of Agriculture and wider departments. Uh, can you comment on that, Jack? Yeah, I, 
like we don't monitor water quality in Ireland. The EPA do. And we accept their findings. You know, there's a water monitoring program in place. And we're in discussions all the time with the EPA and Department of Housing, who are actually responsible for water quality in Ireland. And they acknowledge that sewage sludge is a problem. You know, it is a problem where we have um, domestic treatment plants not working or towns with misconnections, you know, where sewage might be flowing into the water directly, for example, in some places. But still, when you balance it all out and work up all the figures, 85% of nitrogen in a rural catchment is coming from agriculture. And that's in the east, southeast, southwest of the country, where most of the dairy farmers are. In the west of the country, we have problems with phosphorus. And that's due to things like poaching, sediment loss into water courses. So I think it's not a blame game or anything like that, but we have to accept that there is leakage there. And what can we do to reduce the leakage? And and to look on then and, and, and take a step further, uh, Jack, looking to the latest iteration of the nitrates, at this stage, there is a proposal as to what the measures will look like. To take it from a dairy farmer perspective, can you tell us about the new measures and how things are set to change for derogation farmers? Uh, so from the 1st of January next year, it's proposed that nitrogen rates would be cut by 10% or perhaps 15% chemical nitrogen allowances if you're in the east, southeast, southwest of the country. There's a proposal there that you'd need extra soiled water storage, that you wouldn't be allowed to spread soiled water from the middle of November until the middle of January. Soiled water contains about 13 kilos of nitrogen per 10,000 litres. It's estimated that there's 10,000 litres produced per cow per year. It's proposed that we'd look at our, the nitrates expert group, which is made up of officials, experts from the Department of Housing, Chagas, the EPA and ourselves, that the close period for slurry spreading would start earlier. So instead of spreading slurry on the 14th of October, you'd finish up from 2022 around the end of September and 2023, you'd finish up in the middle of September. And the reason there is that the closer you get towards the end of the growing season, the nitrogen that you apply is more likely to be lost. It's also proposed that every farmer would have to have, by the end of, I think it's 2024, four weeks soiled water storage. We have a problem with insufficient storage on farms. Now, overground tanks cost about, about 150 euro per thousand gallons for an overground tank. If you build a bigger tank and the bigger tanks, the bigger you go, the cheaper it gets. A geomembrane line store costs 59 euro per thousand gallons. If you go with concrete, it's obviously dearer. So people can work it out. Like some farmers know that they don't have enough storage already. They might think by the book they have enough, but they know themselves when it comes to January, they're getting very tight. Or for those farmers that are spreading in November and December, because they don't have enough storage, they are going to have to invest because that practice just can't continue because it's polluting the water and it's not acceptable. Um, it's also proposed that, say, after harvesting cereal crops like barley, wheat or oats, that you'd give a run of... Uh, uh, a shallow cultivator or a tine cultivator or something within a week of harvest so that any nitrogen that remains in the soil will be soaked up by the, um, by the weeds that start to grow. It's proposed that you wouldn't be renting land or it wouldn't count towards your stocking rate if it's more than 30 kilometres from your home farm. And that's because some farmers, not many, but some are taking land far away from home and they're only taking it to put it on their basic payments so that it dilutes their stocking rate. And that kind of thing is doing a disservice to everybody. Um, and what it's doing as well, it means that they have a very high stocking rate on their home farm. And that's where you will see definitely losses of nitrogen on free draining soils where you have very high stocking rates. Like Chagas research has shown that the derogation is safe. So to use up to 250 kilos per hectare of livestock manure, along with the chemical fertilizer allowance, is safe according to research. And yet we see deteriorating water quality. There's also a proposal there for extensive farmers that were availing of reduced storage throughout wintering. That was for those farmers less than 130 kilos per hectare, that that would only apply now to those less than 100 kilos per hectare. There's also a proposal that if you are in an area identified by, I think it's by Chagask, um, as having high organic matter, that you'd have to sample for the organic matter to see what levels are there. Because if there's high organic matter and peat soils, you can only use maintenance rates of phosphorus. There's also a proposal that more farmers should be allowed to avail of the phosphorus build-up allowance. At the moment, it's only there for those that are from 130 up. 
but according to Chagask and others, that should be that should be made available to other farms as well, so that um, they can avail of this. And then other areas that are being looked at, all the technical tables within the regulation are being reviewed. So things like storage, for example, every cow is expected to produce about 1,100 gallons of slurry per winter, I think. But that's based on figures produced in the 1970s. And cows have changed a lot since. You know, so there's things like that being looked at as well. If you use lime, it's already compulsory on intensively stocked farms that you must use lime to get your pH right because you get much more efficient use of nitrogen and phosphorus. That's being looked at should it be extended to other farms. So really it's wide open, Emma. If anybody has a suggestion to make about any area of the regulations, they should put it in by the 20th of September in writing. So to pick up on some of, of those points, um, you're talking about a reduction in chemical nitrogen in the reg- region of 10 to 15 percent. Do you expect to see a drop in grass growth as a, re- as a result of this reduction? I think if we were just saying, right, there's going to be a cut and there's nothing else you can do about it, yes, there would. But we know from Chagas soil surveys, for example, that there's a large percentage of Irish soil that's not at optimum fertility. So farmers need to use lime, they need to get their phosphorus right, their potassium right. We know from Moorpark there, Deirdre Hennessy is doing a lot of work, and James Humphreys has done it before, that if you use clover, you can reduce chemical nitrogen by 100 kilos per hectare. So there's great scope there for farmers to save nitrogen. We also know that grass doesn't grow if it's below 5 or 6 degrees, and yet sometimes we see farmers spreading fertilizer in January in anticipation of the weather getting better. So there are areas that farmers can save nitrogen, but for anyone that's interested, there is a report on the Chagask website that was published, I think, last October, around the time of the dairy conference, to show the impact of a 10, the economic impact of a 10% reduction in fertilizer. But farmers have a lot of tools there that they can take, things like using low emission slurry spreading. And also Chagask have said in a recent report, because the department asked them to model various scenarios, And Chagask have said that nitrogen use efficiency on farms can go from the mid-20s up to the mid-30s. So nearly a 50% in nitrogen use efficiency on farms is possible. So this is not something that farmers should think is going to ruin them economically or anything like that. There will be benefits to the environment. But fertilizer down here at the moment, Emma, is around €330 a tonne for sulfacan. So there's huge savings to be made as well. And obviously it's going to benefit the environment, but it will take management and planning, soil sampling, talking to an advisor or interpreting them yourself, getting lime out, getting your phosphorus right, getting your potassium right, looking at the crude protein in your feed. All these things will save a farmer money and end up reducing the amount of nitrogen in water. And Jack, I mean, to, to, to continue on that point, you know, for farmers who are in the situation where they may have, um, you know, soil fertility that isn't, isn't at the standard in terms of, as you mentioned, the pH uh, levels and the P and K, you know, they, they don't have clover in their swords. So um, they not necessarily that they're ignoring those technologies, but they haven't used those technologies to date. Um, you know, in in the case where they continue with that trail of thought, is it a case that they either reduce their cow numbers or they feed more concentrate? I'd say they'll have to look at it from an economic point of view. Like, would you not think that they should start measuring the grass and identifying the paddocks that aren't performing and then they'll know? Like, there are systems there, say pasture base is the one that Chagas use, but there are other there's others there as well. Like, how come we have such a difference between what some farmers can achieve with, say, 200 kilos of nitrogen per hectare and what others aren't achieving with 250 or even more? You know, do people know the amount of grass that they're actually growing? So rather than jumping straight away to feeding meal, I'd say jump into measuring grass. Like there are grass 10 courses. Well, you know better than me. There are grass 10 courses still going on all the time, aren't there? Wouldn't that be where a farmer should start? Like the price of meal is going to go up. Uh, barley this year is not at record prices yet, but it's up a lot. And wheat is up and world market prices are up. Fertilizers up. So meal is going to be expensive. So wouldn't you say our natural advantage is growing grass? Wouldn't that be where we should start. Absolutely. I, I hear you, Jack. But as I say, you know, um, th- there is some people and, and, and it, it, it may be the, the easy solution just to, to get that extra couple of tons of concentrate in the yard. To go on then to another point in terms of your soiled water and your slurry storage, like 
you make the point that on some farms there is insufficient storage for slurry and that is leading to problems where people are invariably going to have to spread slurry in the closed period. Um, I, I suppose, could you highlight why this practice is something that is prohibited for, you know, the closed period and why the closed period is identified? So the directive back in 1991, it was recognised like nobody would claim that we have grass growth all year round. In certain parts of Ireland, we'll get over 300 days a year. And that's excellent, 305, 310 maybe down, you know, in the southwest. But generally speaking, grass growth will slow off from now on. We'll get a higher water table, so the water in the ground is coming to the surface. And the days are getting shorter. Like anybody that's going to juvenile GA matches now or out for a walk in the evening knows that the days are getting shorter. And when the days get shorter, crops and grasses crop slow down their growth. And this is the most vulnerable time of year. And when the regulations came in first back in 2005 and 2006, it was a requirement within it that we had to monitor the effectiveness of it. So the department support Chagask every year to the tune of, it used to be a million and a half euro, now it's up two and a half million per year for the agricultural catchments programme. And that, there's intensive monitoring on those programmes, on those six catchments around Ireland. And what they show is that during what we call the close period, and after storm events at any time of the year, you get a flush of nutrients out of the soil. So nitrogen is washed out of the soil. Like you'd never hear a call for someone to be allowed to buy urea and spread it in December because it's a fine day or a frosty day. So to me, people are just dumping slurry or dumping soil water if they're spreading it. Like even if we get a dry week there in November, you'll see people saying you can't farm by calendar and it's this and that and it's stupid. But it's the time of year that's most vulnerable for loss. I think somewhere up in the region of 50% of nutrient losses occur over the winter. And when you think about it, it makes sense. Like, it's not long away that children will be going to school in the dark and coming home in the dark. So look how short the growing period is that day. For example, temperatures will be down below 5 or 6 degrees. If you look at the grass growth curve, it's starting to taper off now. And it doesn't get going again till January. And that's why we have a closed period, because the nitrogen that you're applying in slurry or soiled water isn't going to be taken up. Now, no matter what time you apply slurry, what time of the year, if there's heavy rainfall forecast within 48 hours, you're going to lose it. So people say, it's stupid, I can apply slurry in July and yet it could rain. That's wrong. And it costs 50, 55 euro an hour with a tanker to spread slurry. So why not apply it when you get most value? The only reason you apply it in November or December, I think, is because you don't have enough storage. And that's on four out of 10 dairy farms don't have enough storage. And you made the point already, uh, Jack, in terms of the the cost of buying nitrogen, and it is a really, really expensive product. And, you know, where farmers are going out in that vulnerable closed period, or also, you know, I suppose, when things open up, if conditions aren't right, um, you know, it is to give the, I suppose, the land the opportunity to, you know, to be travelable um, and give the farm the optimum opportunity to use that slurry. I mean, our our colleagues in Johnstown Castle and also um, an advisor in in the um, in the Cork East area, William Birchill, would always quantify the level of NP and K. And the reality is, if you're not spreading it in the right conditions, you're not getting the optimum from it, and you're paying that three hundred plus euro a ton for nitrogen. Um, you know, to, to again play devil's advocate with you, Jack, um, if if we're going to extend the close period, is there a situation where more people are going to actually break the rules and spread during that period? But, sorry, just to go back on what you said first, Emma, and then I'll come to that. You're so right about the soil and damaging the soil. And the other thing there, like when I was talking, I mentioned nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium and lime. But what about all the other trace elements in the soil? There's a very good um, thing on YouTube there if people just Google it. It's David Wall with Glanbia on some program. David is a researcher in Johnstown Castle. And he's talking about the impact of soil compaction on grass growth. And as far as I can remember, it was over a ton per hectare, which is a massive amount of grass that people are failing to grow. As regards, say, changing the regular... So I think getting your soils right and functioning healthy is so important. And there's an excellent podcast there uh, it's just lately in the last week or two by Fiona Brennan in Johnstown Castle. 
around soil health, getting the soils functioning properly, which will also allow you to reduce the amount of fertilizer that you need. As regards people breaking the law, like really that's like saying, I live on a, it's not much more than a lane here in the countryside. And what you're saying is that the speed limit on that should never be reduced because people will break it. It's not the right thing to do. To spread slurry when there isn't growth is not the right thing to do. Slurry should be going out in spring time with low emission equipment when there's growth and when the land is able to take it. Every week now on Met Air and on the farm and forecast on a Sunday, there's grass growth predictions. When people see there's going to be grass growth, well, then you should be applying your slurry because applying it at the wrong time of the year is a waste of money. And that four in 10 dairy farmers who don't have sufficient facilities right now, there's obviously a, an investment to be made in facilities and there's a cost to that. I, I mean, you know, a natural question that, that farmers are going to think of now is, are there any grants available to farmers to make that investment? T- to you, Jack, is there anything that's going to help them achieve that? Well, first off, you can't grant aid someone to become compliant with something that's the law since 2006. So the department can't grant aid you there. On the soil to water proposals, if they're accepted and come in, there will be grant aid available for those. And I suppose the advice when you're building a tank, no matter whether it's for slurry or soil to water, would be to oversize it, to put in place sufficient storage. Like farmers know with tanks whether they have enough room or not, put in place sufficient storage that's going to get you into February. Don't be saying I'm going to get to the 12th of January or the 15th or whatever the date is in your area. Put in enough storage. The other thing here would be maybe there's room for industry support to come in. Would the banks give low cost loans to farmers to invest in environmentally friendly things like slurry storage really is? And that's the way about it as well. But there won't be grants for anyone that's non-compliant. It's just not legally possible. And, you know, in a lot of instances uh, from a farming perspective, farmers are looking to become lean and, you know, not overproducing or, you know, not having too much product in the yard, uh, f- you know, that that would be considered waste. From the perspective of something like slurry storage and, and now soiled water storage, there probably isn't a case where you should ha- just about have enough. It's, it's you should have maybe more than what you actually need to, I suppose, future proof and make your business sustainable as, you know, regulations may change in the future. I I suppose just to come back to a point, you mentioned a a YouTube video with David Wall from Johnstown Castle and and you mentioned a podcast um, with Fiona Brennan. Um, That was with the Environment Edge uh, with Cahill Summers and Deirdre Glynn and definitely worth um, a, a listen back. I suppose to move on to another point for discussion and a proposal within nitrates, uh, Jack, in terms of banding and and I guess implications of the banding on stocking rate, we would have spoken um, previously with Lauren Shalou and he outlined the various milk yields and what that corresponds to. But could you give us a reminder? If you're under four and a half thousand litres, it's 82 kilos. Between four and a half and six and a half thousand is 92. And over six and a half, I think it's 106. I can't know. I might be one or two kilos out there. But the general principle is that banding is going to apply. Up until this point, we've been using averages and it's not really representing on the ground. Like some people are feeding half a ton of meal. Others are feeding up to two tons of meal. And there's a huge variation. The important thing to remember is that about 70% of the milk is produced in the middle band. There's about 17% in the upper band and then 12% at the lower band. The problem with this is change, I suppose. Change is hard and timing of it. So when will it be introduced from? And that's something we'll have to tease out during the consultation. And the consultation is open until the 20th of September. And then after that, regulations have to be agreed here in Ireland before we bring them to the Commission. But farmers could be looking back at what they produced last year because that's the way it's likely to be based. It's not going to be forward looking. It'll be based on what you produced in the previous year, based on what you deliver to the co-op and the amount of cows you have on the AM system. 
and like I mean f- t- to farmers and to have a think about this Jack um, you know farmers would have been restricted for in excess of 30 years with a milk quota based on volume um, you know look, looking at, at at this suggestion and the proposal that you have, have laid out um, and I know that you know you would have worked modelling with Chagas in relation to these figures but I mean is, is this a signal of a new quota um, in terms of the number of cows you can milk on your farm or indeed the, the volume of milk that you can imp- you can produce per cow? Well, I suppose there's another way of looking at it. Like, what's the environment able to bear? And what kind of licence have we to pollute the environment? Because research from Chagas says that up to 250 kilos per hectare of livestock manure on certain soil types is safe. And if we're exceeding that in places, and we are, well, then we're going to cause pollution. And we must remember that there's a social license there. Like we talked earlier on there about the availability of grants. Well, they're funded by the European taxpayer and the Irish taxpayer. And we not have a right to expect clean water. Like agriculture is leaky. But at what point do you say, you know, you can't, you can't go beyond that. Like there's only so much the environment can tolerate before we do irreparable damage. Now, I think we're lucky at the moment in that we can improve water quality and fairly quickly as long as everyone rolls in and we take the actions that are here in this programme and that have been in previous programmes. It'll be for each farmer to work out the best system on his or her farm. It's not a cap on production because farmers can still export slurry, but they have to think about the impact they're having on the environment as well as the economic impact. I mean, to take a step away from, you know, the policy makers and the farmers themselves, there are a huge amount of players, um, you know, engaging in dairy farming, be it your co-op, the per- the merchant, um, you know, the vet, uh, you know, there are various players. Um, what sort of a role should industry or do industry have in working with dairy farmers to actually achieve the goals in terms of reductions in environmental, in environmental impacts? They have the most important role to play of anybody, I'd say, because they're the people buying the product. They're the people selling the product, you know, selling fertilizer, selling meal, giving advice to farmers. At the moment, every co-op, every dairy co-op has an agricultural sustainability support and advisory program advisor that deals solely with environmental issues. And I would encourage any dairy farmer that has an issue around nitrates or the environment to ring their co-op and ask to speak to that free advisor that the co-ops have there. Because in other countries, you're incentivized to have more biodiversity on your farm or change the way you farm. And I think co-ops can do that here. But a real concrete way they are doing it is through these advisors. So for anybody that's listening, if you're not happy with anything I'm saying or you want to hear more, ring the co-op and ask to speak to this advisor and they'll be able to explain actions on your farm that will help to keep you profitable but also benefit the environment. And finally, Jack, I think, you know, we've talked at length and we have really challenged you on the suggestions and, and the proposals within the nitrates derogation going forward. Now, you have mentioned a couple of times throughout our conversation about, you know, making submissions and, and, and welcoming submissions from farmers in terms of suggestions that they might have in terms of how the policy should look, um, you know, and, and essentially you're, you're open to input from farmers, um, you know. I suppose my question to you is, um, you know, how much time is left for farmers to make a submission? And, you know, how much does the farmer input play in terms of how the policy will turn out at the end of the day? It's a really important role. So the consultation is open until the 20th of September. And if you Google nitrates consultation on gov.ie, you know, that's, that's where you'll get it, the email address or the postal address to apply to. I suppose what farmers need to remember is that for the first time ever, there's a target there about the amount of nitrogen we need to reduce going into our water. And each of the measures proposed contribute to that target. None of them on their own are enough, but each will help. So if you're saying, for example, the proposal around soil water is wrong, we should be let's spread it all year round. Well, we might be saving a little bit of nitrogen there, say half a kilo or a kilo. So where is that? saving going to come from then if we don't do that so that's all i'd ask that people are measured in what they submit if there are things there that you think are impractical or can't work on the ground well they should be pointed out i don't think like we always get 
um, proposal saying that there's an economic impact to this. And yes, there is. Like I said, €59 Euro per thousand gallons on a geomembrane line store or 150 per thousand gallons on an overground tank. But if we want to stay farming, and we do, and we want a successful sector, and we want to keep exporting the 13 or 14 billion worth of product every year, we have to prove that we're living up to our environmental claims. And at the moment, they're very doubtful. Like, how can we say the claims that are made through Origin Green, that we're doing everything we can for the environment, yet we have huge ammonia emissions from agriculture, greenhouse gases, water quality trends deteriorating. And all these are within our control. Like farmers can take control of this. And we can show in the next couple of years, farmers are doing everything they can. We're going to stop this decline in water quality and we'll actually reverse it. We can reverse this trend. Like this is, this is what's really important for everybody to understand. It's not like we're finished here. Like there's an opportunity here to take hold of this. And we can be a world leader on market, on the environment, and showing that we're real about it. It's not just a marketing spin. We are actually doing what we're saying, what we're talking about. So it should be seen as an opportunity. Anybody that's going on to a farm needs to think about the advice they're given to a farmer. Whether you're an advisor doing a scheme application, a fertilizer salesperson, or the industry buying the milk off the farmer. Like what kind of message is the farmer getting? Is the whole time it's all around increasing production? Is there going to be a reward from industry back to farmers for changing practice? Because it can't all come from cap. Like, why isn't the consumer paying more for quality milk that's produced off a good environment? And can the co-op segregate milk that's produced in a way that's damaging the environment? Or is it something that's being considered? Because I believe that industry have to take the lead role here and work with farmers to change what's happening. And I guess just to wrap up, Jack, I mean, there has been a huge amount of information and content in this conversation. A lot of the practices that you have discussed that are going to aid us in reducing our emissions and our impact on water quality and and just essentially improving water quality. These are all things that we've discussed on this podcast at length with both farmers and researchers, uh, you know, measuring those improvements that people are seeing. Um, You know, it's simple things like the low emission slurry spreading, protected urea, you know, really using our slurry to the best of our advantage, improving soil fertility. I think a question that you would have asked very early on in the conversation is, you know, are we doing our best? And I think that each individual farmer needs to consider their practices um, you know, and work collectively in an effort to improve, um, you know, our environmental uh, footprint and our environmental impacts. Thank you, Jack. Thanks very much, Emma Louise. That's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast. And my thanks to Jack Nolan for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.